Take a step on the road to fun. Take a step on the road into nature. Take a step on the road into the past. Take a step on the road to sharing powerful stories. Take a step on the road to experiencing big ideas. Take a step with Humanities on the Road as speakers from the Pennsylvania Humanities Council take you on a journey through history, literature, the arts, and the world around you. Learn more about Humanities on the Road and discover why the humanities are important to you at humanitiesontheroad.org. Welcome to Humanities on the Road, where we join you from the Scranton Cultural Center asking what social dances like the waltz and the tango can teach us about times past. Hello everyone, I'm Tracy Matisak. Humanities on the Road is a wonderful opportunity for audiences all over Pennsylvania to explore history and art and the ideas that shape our world. We are at the Scranton Cultural Center at the Masonic Temple, and this building was designed in the 1920s, and it is one of the most impressive structures in northeastern Pennsylvania. As part of our program today, we're going to look at social dances like the waltz and the tango that spanned presidencies from James Buchanan all the way up to Teddy Roosevelt. So we're talking about the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. And be on the lookout because some members of our audience will be prominently featured in the opening number. Our special guests today, Nancy Walker and Jeff Savage, have dedicated themselves to preserving social history through dance programs performance, education, and instruction. They perform in period costumes, and they even include historical readings as part of their presentation. We'll have an opportunity to talk with them a little bit later in the program, but for now, we turn it over to Nancy and Jeff for May I Have the Pleasure of This Dance. Please join me as we welcome Nancy Walker and Jeff Savage. Although the Civil War lasted four long years, it did not affect the social round in the major cities of the North and many in the South. And even though Washington, D.C. was so close to the theater of war, grand balls continued apace, and life went on as normally as possible. Let us travel back to the 1860s, a time of elegance and conflict. Imagine you are walking along a street in Washington, D.C., you hear the strains of music coming from a large building. Entering, you see a grand ballroom ablaze with light and full of elegantly dressed people waiting to dance. It is Mr. Lincoln's first inaugural ball. Mr. Lincoln, looking exhausted and worried by his white kid gloves, leads the grand march arm in arm with DC Mayor James Barrett while Mrs. Lincoln followed with former admirer, Senator Douglas. Later that evening, Mrs. Lincoln, dressed all in blue with a necklace and bracelets of gold and pearls, also danced a quadrille with Senator Douglas. The grand ball. The scene is set, the die is cast. Here comes the grand ball at last. Seek out your gloves of white two pairs to see you through the night. We welcome you dancers all to this most splendid ball. Now you with your cloak and hat can part, and then, huzzah, the dance can start. With music from the enchanting band, we will waltz hand in hand. Satins and silks rustle and glitter. As couples whirl, nothing prettier all creating such a splendid scene, at night's end we'll say, we're glad we've been. And as the dawn breaks clear and bright, we can all reminisce what a wonderful night. Our first dance this evening is a grand march. It opened every ball, not only in America, but also in Europe. And it gave people the opportunity to see who was in the ballroom, 
what they were wearing, if they were wearing the latest styles, and it helped them to have time to pick out prospective dance partners for the evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, will you please take your partner for the Grand March. The Scandalous Waltz, from Exercises for Ladies, published in London, 1836. The waltz is a dance of too loose a character, and unmarried ladies should refrain from it altogether, both in public and private. Dizziness is one of the great inconveniences of the waltz. The character of this dance, with its rapid turnings, the clasping of the dancers, their exciting contact, the quick and long succession of lively emotions, sometimes produces in women a very irritable constitution, palpitations, spasms, and other accidents, which should induce them to renounce it. <laughs> Our next dance is a mid-Victorian waltz, and it's first documented in 1787. It was made extremely popular by the Strauss family, whose music we still play today, and it's just utterly beautiful. And it's one of the most enduring dances spanning 230 years. So ladies and gentlemen, we will now perform a mid-Victorian waltz. Thank you. 
fashion in the Victorian ballroom. A gentleman would wear a swallow-tailed coat, cut off at the waist, to allow me to put my hands in the pocket of my trousers. I'm also wearing a cotton stand-up collar shirt and something which we call a cravat, which I could tie in many different ways. Over the top of that, I'm wearing a waistcoat, which is the way we would pronounce waistcoat in those particular times. On my feet, I'm wearing my dance shoes because I wouldn't go into a ballroom and dance in street shoes. I'd always carry a pair of dance shoes and change into them before the ball began. And on my hands, I'm wearing white gloves. Originally, these would be made of white kid and the idea of them is so that they don't leave sweaty palm prints on the ladies' beautiful ball gowns. I'm wearing a typical fashion for a Victorian lady for the ballroom. On my head is a fold cap, called such because it falls over my ears, and it's decorated with lace, ribbons, and flowers for the ballroom. My dress is a typical style for this time period, Except for the ballroom, I have a low neck and short sleeves. If this was a day dress, I would have a higher neck and longer sleeves. It becomes so hot in the ballroom because they were so popular, so many people came, it would be extremely hot, and that's why I need a little bit of breathing space in my dress. Now, I'm not normally this shape. What is giving me this lovely round shape is something called a crinoline. It's a hooped petticoat made of cotton, and the beauty of this invention is that I can turn, I can jump, I can zoom around, and my skirts do not get tangled up with my feet. So when we do our next dance, you'll see how beautifully this works. Now underneath this, I'm wearing my latest fashion of hooped stockings. These came in wild and vivid colors, but this was the popular stocking of the day. And gentlemen, you may want to avert your eyes because underneath all this are my drawers, which are ladies' underwear of the time period. They're made of cotton. They're usually decorated with some lace or eyelet at the bottom. And we won't go any further than that. Punch Magazine, London, 1856. What about those hoops? Public attention is painfully called to the state of isolation in which fashionable females are placed by the extraordinary amount of crinoline which they wear about them, and which renders it impossible for anyone to approach within some feet of them. If a lady in the full dress of the period were to faint, it would be quite out of the power of any benevolent being to get sufficiently near to her to catch her or tender his support. We cannot understand the cause which induces the ladies of the present day to raise up such a barrier around them as to compel everybody to keep at a respectful distance and to place themselves in, as it were, a state of blockade. Now, ladies, your object in dress, we presume, is to please and not to please yourself